Knock him out the box, place. Knock him out the box, knock him out the box, place. Knock him out the box, knock him out the box, place. Knock him out the box, knock him out the box, place. Knock him out the box, you know more villa. Stories with more villa. Spit real facts, so you know more chiller. Knock him out the box, place. Hey, good day, good day, good day, good day. Thanks for joining me. Just in case you're joining me for the very first time, I am your host, The Real Brian Glaze Gibbs. This is my platform. What I do is I talk about the good, I talk about the bad, I talk about the ugly. Like I said right now, what I do is utilize my life experience as cautionary tales for these young kids to understand that there's no shortcut in life. Only thing come fast is trouble, easy to get into, hard to get out. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, share, support. You know what? Several years ago, um, I got the opportunity to meet with Vlad. And we did a hell of an interview. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and recap and want y'all guys to listen, understand, like say who I once was, what I was a part of. And right now, was, that was then, this is now. And even right now, doing that interview was like a lot of in-depth and a lot of things that was said. And you know what? To me, listen to the words. Understand the message. It's nothing to glamorize. I admit that I was a lost soul, that I screwed my life up, you know, because I wanted to be down, I wanted to be cool. I became Brian Clay Skids between the age of 14 and 24. And trust me, like I said, I did every day in my life from A to Z, and I paid a price. I paid a price. But I'm here to tell you now, guess what? It's not worth it. Stop. Pick up the brick. Throw it at that prison wall for absolutely nothing. Because the only thing going to end up, you're going to end up in the penitentiary for the rest of your life, or you're going to die of a violent death. And right now, is, is it worth it? No, it's not. Enjoy. Peace, love, and prosperity. The real Brian Glaze Gibbs. All right, here we go. We have uh, infamous street figure Brian Glaze Gibbs in the building. Thank you for joining us. Vlad, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of talk about you, a lot of rumors. Uh, there's a documentary that you actually put out recently as yeah. well. Inside of Mind uh, of Killer. Exactly. As well as a book that you put out. Beyond Lucky, Brian Glaze Gibbs Story. Exactly. But we're going to go ahead and do a sit down and kind of go through your whole story uh, from the very beginning. So let's go ahead and start. So you grew up in East New York? No, I was born in the backseat of a police car in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, New York. And what happened with that was um, my family member called the Amlams, like called 911 because my mother was going to labor. And back then, the police got there first and they see that she was about to deliver. So they took her opposed to waiting for the Amlams and just so happened I was delivered in a backseat of police car and took into Kings County Hospital. Okay. Well, where'd you actually grow up? Brooklyn, New York, the Bedford-Stuyvesant section I started out growing up. And then by the time I was like 11, 12 years old in the sixth grade, we moved to the East New York section of Brooklyn. <laughs> okay. And East New York is a very notorious part of, of New York. Uh, I've been through there a few times and I've always dr driven very quickly <laughs> through there. Smart I didn't man. stop and, and hang out. Uh, Mike Tyson came from there, right? Mike Tyson came from Brownsville. Brownsville. Isn't that considered East New York, though? Brownsville and East New York. No, you can't tell a Brownsville that East New York is Brownsville and Brownsville, East New York. It's, you know, right? It's close by. So okay. it's still Brooklyn. It's close by. But people are very... Now, don't get the mix up with the two. East New York is East New York. Brownsville is Brownsville. Okay. But they, you know what? They both shitty areas. Okay. Okay. And you grew up uh, with your mother. Uh, was your father around as well? No, my father wasn't around, but then again, my mother had, you know, common law and great man, um, worked for the transit authority, um, learned a lot from him. You know, initially being a young knucklehead kid, we didn't appreciate the value that he brought to the table, but it took a while for us to understand, like, you know, he was there and he was more of a father than my biological father ever was. And I love him to death now because the things that, you know, he was dead. Here it is, you taking care of kids that's not yours. And you becoming part of a team. And we, you know, we was as much of a family as we could be. Gotcha. And you have some siblings as well. Yes, I have brothers and sisters. How many total? And what, for my mother, I have, it's me and my brother and my two sisters. For my father, ah, uh, man, I can't even say. At what point did you really start getting into the streets? Because I know in your documentary you talked about selling fake chains. Was that sort of your first... 
you know, dabble into the streets or were you doing something before that? You know what? It's like um, when you leave the Bedford Stuyvesant section of New York's, like Brooklyn, it's like you leave in the suburb going into the concrete jungle. And when you get to the East New York section, yeah, you're right, it's totally different. So selling fake jewelry was a start, but it was like we was out there doing anything, anything to make a fast buck. Rather was selling the fake jewelry and, you know, burglary. Burglary was the first crime that, you know, I can recall getting into. Okay, and that was breaking into houses? Breaking into houses, uh, um, you know, climbing terrace, you know, um, sneaking into people that left the terrace door open. You know, yeah, any entry, like anything that you can do that you can basically right now be invasive and go, un, you know, detected that you can get in somewhere, steal some things, rob the place and get out of there. Okay. And you're also robbing people on the train. Oh, uh, yeah. We did a little bit of that, too, man. We did a lot of that. Yeah, and, okay. you know, even with that being said, it's like, you know, the crazy part about that, being young, being dumb, and wanting to take shortcuts. Because, once again, you get on a train. And sometimes we used to get on a train, sit next to a victim. Because what you do is you size them up and you look at them. You look at how they dress. Well-dressed. Uh, you see somebody with a nice watch. You know, look like money. So basically what I used to do is I'll sit down on somebody else and sit down next to another one and sit, you know, right there to the side of them. And the game was always, Mr. My man right there got a gun. Give it up. And you have most people, when you approach them like that, you know what? They are afraid and they'll give it up. And, you you know, I had a situation where I one guy that we was in the subway station and I put the, you know, stop, Mr. Don't make a move. My man got a gun. We'll blow your head off, give us everything. And this gentleman, like literally, my man approached, pull out the gun. He slapped it away. And he say, just like this, word for word, don't y'all guys think it's kind of too cold to be playing? And he kept going. And me, literally, I bust out and laugh because it was funny. <laughs> it's like this individual, like, slapped the gun away and basically right now, don't y'all think it's kind of too cold to be playing? <laughs> that's gangster. Yeah, that's gangster. Is that <laughs> legit gangster. Yeah. Okay. Now there was a situation where you robbed a lady's house, and I guess you stole her mother's wedding ring. I'm out. Time out. Time out. By that time, I was one of my guys. One of you know the guys that my little crew that we was down with. You know, right now is like you know at the while, like you know you're right. We used to do all that stuff, but it came to a point in time. Yeah, one of the house that was hit part of what the crew that I was down with. They stole. You know, they stole a bunch of stuff, but. The lady sent out word. Only thing she wanted back was the ring that belonged to her mother. And if she get that back, you know, she don't care about nothing else. So the key was my guys didn't pay that message any mind. So she had a nephew, I guess, like, you know, more or less, like just came home. And I guess somebody pointed my boy out and they pointed him out and say, like, he's part of that little crew. And they snatched him up and, you know, I guess, like, beat the living daylight of him and left him stranded, butt naked in the Bronx for dead. Okay, so they kidnapped and tortured him. Yeah, they kidnapped and tortured him. But he, he survived. Yeah, he survived. He's alive and well. I see him on my timeline every now and then. Yeah, he's still here. Okay. But back then, we was probably like 14, 15 years old. After you saw your friend get, get kidnapped and tortured like that, did you say, okay, maybe this whole robbery thing isn't for me? Yeah, it was burglary. But like, Bur it was, burglary, it was burglary. But it, what it was is then, Blod, it's like, to me, when I decided it wasn't for me, because we was in, like, we was going to the Linden Plaza area. We were from Cyprus. So Linden Plaza is approximately, like, you know, six to eight block away from us. And if you look at Linden Plaza, it was much neat, brand newer than our projects. And you had approximately five big buildings. And the first floor started from where our floor started, like the sixth floor. And it's like sky rise. And they got balconies. And people that, we was under the impression, because you live in Linden Plaza, Oh, man, these folks are rich. But you know what? It was no richer than our family. But the perception is everything. So to me was, we used to have inside people, used to befriend people, and they'll, their friend, they'll go out there, hang out with their friends, and they'll leave the balcony door open. So what we'll do is go to a friend house, and we'll climb their terrace, you know, two floors up, three floors to the side, because we already know that balcony door is open. And to me, when you're looking up in the sky, and I'm like, man, you know, the more and more you did it a couple of times, and I said, nah, I'm not doing this. 
Because once again, only thing it takes is one slip, one fall, one mistake, and that's it. It's over. Yeah, I mean you're dead. Yeah, you're dead. You dead? Oh, you jacked up pretty bad. Yeah, for the rest of your life. Exactly. In a wheelchair or whatever.